at home, I have four boys, and sometimes it gets crazy at our house with four boys, and it's just like out of control. And it seems like constantly they may be getting into it, and me and mom are getting frustrated, and we're just like all, see, it seems like we're doing the same, no, 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 and they aren't listening, and then we're getting mad, and every now and then it gets so crazy that it's time to pull everyone together and have a, a family moment, a time where I can talk to my boys and they can hear my heart. Um, where I pull them in and say, hey, Isaac, Ash, and Judah, and Titus, um, things have been kind of crazy lately. You know, dad's kind of raised his voice, and, and I want you to know that, that I love you. And, um, but at the same time, I love you, but the actions that, and the choices that you're making, we really need to think about those things. And so tonight, uh, as we look at this as family, and I kind of look at myself as your guys' shepherd and your guide, tonight I want to pull everyone in and say it's time to have a heart-to-heart -heart with you guys. Um, that's why I'm having everyone sit in their group. I'm kind of treating this as a, a family meeting, okay? And to know this, that, uh, man, I love you guys with all my heart and there are so many times in my life over the last nine years of doing ministry that I ask myself this question. I ask myself the question, um, is what I'm doing, like, is there purpose to what I'm doing? I mean, am I really making a difference? I mean, I, sometimes I, I look and I'm like, man, I, I, <laughs> this is going to sound weird. I go to bed thinking about you guys. I wake up with you guys in my mind in the middle of the night. Or I wake up to my kids screaming and then I try to go back to sleep and I can't go back to sleep because someone's on my mind. And uh, me and my wife, uh, you know, we talk about you guys. And In fact, this whole night is kind of because Julie and I were talking that, you know, after a point in time, and I need everyone to listen to me, I want everyone to really listen closely because this is the thing. This is, this is a family talk right now, and this is my heart. And I'm going to please ask you to honor me as someone who is giving my life to you guys. I mean, I do get paid for this, but, um, but you guys are more than just nine to five to me. And uh, I know some of you are thinking, well, I'm a first-time visitor. You don't even know me. Well, I hope that tonight that you hear my heart and you hear Jesus speaking to you and you would begin to see God for the first time, and that we could be more like family. Um, but uh, I've, we, me and Julia were, were um, talking, and we were looking and just thinking about the amounts of people that come here. I mean, we had over 200 people at the dodgeball tournament last week, which was awesome. And sometimes we look at you guys, and, and not in a bad way, but as we're praying and trying to figure out, are we doing, are we making a difference? Is is what we're doing matter? It, are, we, are we doing the right thing? And then we, and we'll look, and so we'll look at students and say, like, like these students, um, man, they've been coming here for so long, and I don't feel like there has been any, they, they're, just, they're just not listening to us. And the, then these other students who, man, I see that they hear us, and they, they, they try, and then they just fall off, and then we won't see them for months. And, and then, then we're saying, oh, those students, there, there's some that really s have found God and his love. And, and to be honest with you, really, it all comes down to this. I mean, it all boils down to our choices. Um, I, have, I was meeting with a student a couple months ago, and I've heard this a lot. And so um, I heard this student said to me, they're like, it doesn't even really matter what you're doing. You know, it, it's just pointless. And, he, and this person wasn't just talking about for him. He was talking about just in general. He was just telling me that your job is worthless. It's a very awesome time. And I've heard that before. And, uh, and so when you hear questions like that, I, I want you to know is that really me sitting up in this chair, I, I face the same thoughts that you guys face, the, the thoughts of insecurity and doubt and failure and fear um, about my looks, you know, about, about what I'm doing, about all kinds of things. 
Sometimes, just like you have people speak into your life that makes you think those thoughts, I have spe people speak into my life that thinks those thoughts. And so you really have to ask yourself a question. It, what, what is it that makes someone like me, who some of you might say, well, you're a pastor. I mean, you know, you, you look at me differently. I mean, you have it together. What is it that makes someone like me different than someone like you? Or what makes... What makes someone that you look up to that you would say, they're amazing? Or, man, if you look up to them and say, they understand God, or they, they have it together, what makes them different than you? You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's not that they don't have the same thoughts. It's not that they don't have the same doubts or fears or insecurities. So what is it that makes them different? We want to talk about that tonight. And so what I want to do is I want to do some, have some fun a little bit. And I want Matthew, can you come up here? Yeah, I want you to come sit up here. This is family time, guys. Family time. No, by, this is not scripted. No one knows that I'm calling them up. In fact, to be honest with you, let's give Matthew a hand. I don't know who I'm calling up. I got to be honest with you. Go ahead and sit up here. Matthew, I didn't know I was going to call you up here until the last moment, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of speak my sermon differently. I'm going to speak it to people sitting on stage. Is that okay with, with you? Okay, so, all right. Let me see if I actually am out of control here. I need to put page numbers on my hand. All right, here we go. Maybe this works. Okay. I'm going to read some Bible to you, and this is in Romans chapter 8, and I gave you guys notes this week. I don't normally do that. It's not fill in the blanks. You guys can just follow along when you can see that on there. Uh, this is not on your notes, but it says this. I want you to, Romans 8, 9, Matthew. This is what Romans 8, 9 says to you. God himself has taken up residence in your life. You can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. Are you listening to me? I believe that God wants me to tell you this. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, that he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus which was bring you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life that you used to live. With his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. Okay, that, that scripture right there, I want you to understand. For those who, of you who have asked Jesus into your hearts, this is who you are. That you have Jesus living inside of you. And the same life that lived inside of Jesus is the life that lives inside of you. Okay. For those of you who have not, it's kind of actually talking about you. It says, that, it says of course, who is not, uh, if, if, you, if you don't, then you aren't going to know what we're talking about. And it's my hope if you don't know Jesus tonight, that you begin to know what we're talking about. And so really, this is what I'm saying. Christians, Matthew... We have a new heart and a new spirit, but we will struggle with many of the unhelpful ways of thinking and behaving that we grew up with. See, when you come to Jesus, uh, um, man, you become spiritually alive, but you still have all of this life that you used to live before you knew Jesus. Um, this is what the Bible calls the flesh. Okay, that's a weird word. So I want to talk about the flesh tonight. I want you to begin to understand the flesh. Um, we don't have to give into the flesh anymore. That's what this verse is saying. We can choose day by day and moment by moment whether to live according to flesh's desires or according to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And as you, as someone who has asked Jesus into your heart, you don't no longer have to live by the flesh. And so I'm going to explain what the flesh is because that's a really weird word tonight. Um, and sometimes it's like this. When we become Christians, um, we think it's like fl flicking on a switch. I mean, that's how people explain it, right? Everything's different. We think that everything's supposed to be different, right? It's like flipping on a switch. Uh, immediately, we think that we should automatically do everything right. But I don't know about you. For those of you who have asked Jesus into your heart, was it like that? Some of you, yes. Some of you, man, everything completely changed. For some of you, it wasn't like flicking on a switch, and, and you still have, uh, you discover that that's just not the case. It's not like flicking on a switch. We often don't feel uh, different at all when we become a Christian sometimes. Um, we still have the same bad habits. We still have the same temptations. In fact, 
when we become Christians, it seems like the things that we are tempted to do wrong, the temptations get bigger. Have you ever noticed that? Man, you give your life to Jesus or you have this moment where you say, I'm sorry for what I'm doing and I, I, I'm moving on. Uh, forgive me, God. I'm never doing that again. And then when you walk away, it's not just that you have the temptation again. It's that the temptation gets stronger. Have you ever noticed that? That's, that's, that's something that we face. And so I want you, I want, we're going to think about two questions right now. Are you ready for these two questions? What changes when we become Christians and what doesn't change when we become Christians? Because things change, but there's some things that don't change, okay? And so I want you to understand tonight what the truth says about what does change and what, and what doesn't change. So the first thing, what changes when we become Christians? Okay, number one, we are a new creation and have a new heart and a new spirit within us. Are you feeling okay right now? Are you feeling really awkward? Okay, good. He's doing a good job, though. You're looking at my eyes. I, I want this how I want it to be. I want, you, I want you to think, thank you for that, that I'm speaking to you guys. Uh, but I, I, I just felt like calling you up here because I wanted to speak this directly to you. That you're a new creation when you become a Christian. You have a new heart and a new spirit within you. And I put on your notes that that's um, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, 17, that we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old is gone and the new has come. Okay, number two, we have a new life in Christ right now together. And this is what we have. We have a new life in Christ with significance, acceptance, and security that we were designed for. I said that backwards, but you saw it in the notes. So when you give your life to Christ, you're new, and you have this life that now is full of, and we talked about this, significance. You have a significant life. You have a life where you are accepted, even though your past is ugly, and you have a life where you can have security where you don't have to doubt your day-to-days, that you are now alive, that you can live free, okay? Uh, Before we become Christians, whether we realize it or not, the devil was our boss. Okay, whether you realize it or not, before you become a Christian, the devil is your boss. But, and, and, he, and we did things that he wanted us to do. But now, when you become a Christian, you have a new boss. I don't know if you ever thought about it like that, but when you become a Christian, you're basically saying, when you say, God, I want you to be the Lord of my life, you're basically saying, God, I want you to be the boss of my life. Now, if you work somewhere, like at McDonald's, the boss tells you what to do, right? He, he gives you some freedom. Like if you worked at McDonald's, he'd say, work the cash register, and he doesn't sit over your back and make sure that you're typing in the numbers right. He gives you an assignment, and he begins to try. Now, if you mess up the balance, what does he do? He comes in and says, hey, you messed this up. He might give you a little reprimand, but then he begins to teach you again, this is how you need to do it. See, that's what happens when we give our lives to Christ, is now we no longer have uh, the boss, the devil, telling us what to do, telling us who we are, lying to our minds. But we now have God as our boss, not just telling us what to do, but teaching us how to live. Um, so we, and then we receive forgiveness for all the stuff we've done wrong. Uh, we enter into a relationship with God, and now the most important, the best part is that we'll all go to heaven. That while sometimes things stink out here on earth, that in the end, for all eternity, I'm going to ask everyone to start listening to me, please. Uh, I, I, I am, this is our family time, so. Okay, so that's what changes. Okay, so what doesn't change? And I have this in your notes. Okay, this is going to be kind of obvious, and ladies will probably be kind of disappointed in this, but when we give our lives to Christ, our bodies don't change. Isn't that sad? Wouldn't it be nice if you, like, said, Jesus, come into my heart, and bam, you lost 20 pounds. Or, you guys, you bulked up the muscles a little bit, right? Jesus, come into my heart, bam! Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be so awesome? No? Some of you ladies wish you had the muscles too, though. I mean, who, who would say Jesus coming to my heart would be nice to lose 20 pounds too? I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? My wife's raising her hand. <laughs> Man. But this is the thing. When we give our lives to Christ, something that doesn't change is our bodies. Our bodies don't change. You're like, well, obviously. Okay, thank you. Although we have dramatically changed on the inside, on the outside, we still look the same as before. Okay? So what does that mean? Our flesh was not taken away. So, so let's talk about flesh, okay? So these things don't change because at the beginning, when we were all created, we were all designed to be significant, secure, and accepted. When you were designed at the beginning of time, that's how you were designed to be, to be secure, significant, and accepted. But see, we're born into sin. So when we're born into sin, we still have these desires. These desires never go away. So from our first breath, we are naturally drawn to be accepted, secure, and significant. When, when we're born, we're naturally, from our very first breath, we reach out, well, as babies, we reach out for our parents, okay? We want 
to be accepted. We want security. We want significance. Even before you even know that that's what you're wanting, that's what you're reaching out for. As a baby, it's crazy to think about. You, from your very first breath, you are reaching for those things. You don't want to be left alone. You leave a baby alone in the crib, it screams. It, them, he, she, they scream. They don't want to be left alone. Why do babies not want to be left alone? I mean, with you really being there, what is, the, what is the desire that you fulfill as a baby? What desire are you fulfilling? You're fulfilling a desire in them to be accepted, significant, and secure. Think about it. The baby's screaming. You pick them up and they stop crying. What have you done? You're holding the baby. Well, think, that's what you're doing. From their very, our very first breath, that's what we want. Um, but this is the thing. We often, I mean, how many of you can agree with me? You often don't find that. Even a mom leaves the baby to cry in the crib and just wishes the baby would shut up. <laughs> Notice I said the mom, not the dad. Just, just joking. <laughs> right? I mean, even as a baby, we cry out for security, significance, and acceptance. But even as a baby, we don't find it. And we all know that it, just, it doesn't really get better. It many times gets worse. Right? I mean, you know what, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? So this is the thing. What do we do? Because we want to feel secure, significance, and acceptance, what do we do? We begin to look for that. Okay, this is what we do. Even for a ba- from a baby on, we begin to look for those things. We often turn to many things. Girls shop. Some guys shop. Food. Okay? We can get to obvious ones. Uh, friends. Relationships. Uh, we, we cut, we have self-harm, we have eating disorders, we do all these things to try to gain. I mean, why do we do those things? Why do we cut? Why do we, why do we go through self-harm? It's because we've been hurt so much, and now we still, right, we want to remind ourselves that we can still feel something, right? But why were you hurt to begin with? Because you wanted acceptance, you wanted security, you wanted significance, it all stems back to that's where all of these things that we uh, do stem back from us looking to be fulfilled in those ways. So eventually what happens is before we're Christians, we do things like this and these become our ways of coping, right? Self-harm, eating disorders, just eating. Uh, you know, you ever see the girl that dumped, get, breaks up with her boyfriend and she eats a gallon of ice cream? I mean, what is that? That is your way of coping with the fact that you are insecure right now. You're trying to find security in your gallon of ice cream, okay? Okay, I want, and you're like, amen, it works every time. But do you see what I'm saying? This, we find ways to cope with the fact that we have not been accepted, we have not been significant, and we are not, and we are very insecure people, okay? Because this is the, des- the main desire of our lives that we've been birthed with. So, and then what happens is these things become ingrained habits inside of us. They become a part of us where without even thinking, we find ourselves doing it. Have you ever done that before? And you know that what you're doing is wrong or you don't want to do it. Like even like, okay, let's just take, and this is a very deep subject. Let's take the the subject of cutting. Like you, you know that you don't want to do it. It's not something that you're excited about. Usually you don't do it smiling. Yay. This is so much fun, and I'm not making fun of it, but you know, for those of you out there, you're not excited about doing it, but you've done it so often, and it's become your way of coping that before you even realize you're doing it, you're doing it. And we do this with all kinds of things. For those who binge, before you even realize you're doing it, you're doing it. Before you even realize you're doing many of these things, you're doing these things because they have become ingrained habits inside of you, right? Um, and so then what happens is, uh, and this is what the Bible means when it refers to our flesh, okay? When the Bible refers to your flesh, it's talking about these ingrained habits that are a part of you before you know Christ, okay? When you become a Christian, unfortunately, wouldn't it be awesome? What, what's that, 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 uh, that Office Max commercial that has the big red button? It's like the easy button. Staples, the red store. It's like all the stores are red. Okay, I don't know why. What's that all about? They can all be red, but they got that big button, the easy button. For some reason, when you become a Christian, it would be nice if there was this big fat red button that said reset, you know, and you just hit it and reset everything and forgot 
every way you used to be, and you started completely over. See, because when you become a Christian, you start over with a new heart and a new spirit, but you still have ingrained inside of you the old habits. Okay, so follow me. Are you following me so far? You feeling awkward yet? Is it time to get someone else to come up here? I think it is. You can go ahead and sit down. Let's give Matthew a hand. Matthew, we love you. Who's the next person that wants to come up here? It's like some people are like talking and looking to the side hoping I don't call on them. Oh, some people are looking directly at me hoping I do call on them. All right. Josiah <laughs> raising his hand. All right. I need, um, who did I see that I wanted to bring up here? I need Lexi up here. Lexi, you want to come up here? Come on up, Lexi. Again, I don't know who I'm calling up. It's just whoever I feel like calling up. So you got to believe that that God wants to speak something inside of you. Okay. Thank you, Lexi. How you doing? Thanks for coming to our family time. It's not a talk show, it's family time. If I was sitting down with Isaac, I would talk like this. I'd be like, how you doing, Isaac? See, I want to tell you tonight, Lexi, okay, are you ready for this? That you are incredibly beautiful. No, really. That God loves you, okay? And it's not just about who you are on the outside, but you have an incredibly tender spirit and heart, and he wants to use that, okay? And he's began just in the last six months to really wake you up to who you are. And he wants to continue to build that inside of you. But the problem is, is when we begin to make this commitment, not that it's a problem, when we begin to seek the Lord like we never have before, uh, the devil takes notice of that. See, when you give your life to Christ and you become a new creation and your heart is new and your spirit's alive, that's when the de this is why temptation sometimes gets tougher is because the devil starts to throw it in your face a lot more. And see, God wants to use you, but I'm preparing you that the Bible says that the devil uh, wants to sift some people like wheat, which means he just wants to sift them back and forth, and they'll just be confused. And God wants you to say, listen, you need to focus on me like you never have before, okay, because he's made you new, and he's brought an awakening to you, and he wants to continue to use you. So, so now you're my new person to talk to. Is that okay? Family. We're all f***ing here, though, right, tonight? Okay. All right. Okay, so when we become Christian, there's no reset button um, that, that automatically replaces our old way of being and acting with new godly ways of thinking and reacting. Instead, we have to do this. We have to train and teach ourselves to think in a way that it's in, in line with God's truth. For those of you who have been in my gatherings before and you've heard me tell you that God loves you and you've given your life to Christ, but you feel like things don't change. And, and this is why. It's not that God is not who he said he is. It's that we don't know who God says he is. I want you to catch this. See, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. The truth of who God says you are doesn't change. When we give our lives to Christ, the problem is many times is we don't know who God says that we are. And so this is why we go on living like we've always lived because we don't know the truth of who God says that we are. And so when we give our lives to him, even though now we have acceptance and security and significance in him, we don't feel that acceptance, significance, significance and security because we don't know what the truth of God's word is. So when you give your life to Christ, there's no reset button. So what you have to do, the most important thing that you can do is begin to Train and teach yourself in line of what God's word says about you. When you feel thoughts of insecurity and failure, sometimes all you have to do is hold on to, well, that's not what Pastor Dave says about me. But I encourage you, you have to begin to see what God's word says about you. The Bible calls this renewing our minds, okay? Renewing, okay? Our minds are made new, but since we have ingrained in us old habits, we have to continually renew our minds until we overcome those habits. We, what we do is we're, we, we do this by replacing our old ways of thinking, which was based on lies, and we replace them with new ways of thinking, which is based on God's truth. But you can't replace lies until you know what the truth is. 
You say this. If you know one, if, listen, you know what someone's lying to you, but you don't know what the truth is. So you know you're lying, you know they're lying and you're frustrated about it, but it can't change anything because you still don't know what the truth is. And so what you do when someone's lying to you, what do you do? You seek out the truth, right? How many of you have been lied to before and you don't just let the lie die? You want to know what the truth is. See, what happens to us as Christians, though, we are being lied to, but we continue to listen to the lie instead of seeking out the truth. You following what I'm saying? You guys doing okay? Don't, don't fall asleep on me, Reggie. Okay, good. I know this is family time, but it's going to be okay. I like that word, Reggie, by the way. I really like it. I mean, that word, that name, Reggie. That's a word right there. Okay. At its most basic term, Lexi, uh, the, f- the flesh refers to our physical bodies and... Um, it, by its extension, uh, refers to our instincts and our, our desires that it has. The flesh refers to our physical bodies, our instincts, and desires, okay? I know this is deep, but I don't need you to listen. You could say uh, it, it is the desire to do what comes naturally to us before we know Christ or when we were in our fallen state. Before we know Christ, our flesh is our desire to do what comes naturally to us, okay? Something else didn't change when we become Christians is this. Sin didn't die. I want you to understand this. Sin didn't die. Let me be perfectly clear. I'm going to be clear. Be clear tonight to you, family, brothers and sisters and kids and aunts and uncles. We can't defeat sin. Let me be clear. We can't defeat sin. But the good news is, is that Jesus already defeated it for us. That's what I want you to understand. It's not that we can defeat any of it. You can't come to the altar and say, I'm never going to do that again, and just will it so it never happens. We can't defeat sin. Jesus is the one who defeats sin. I want you to understand that. Okay? Sin is still alive and kicking, tempting us every day to take the quick uh, route to significance, acceptance, and security. And see, this is what we do when we wake up in the morning and we're having a bad day. We want to take the uh, uh, initial quick route. The first cute guy that talks to us, yes, I'll marry you. Please, I will take your last name. Right, that guy's only in seventh grade. I don't even know if he's a man yet. I don't care. The first, first opportunity for acceptance, significance, and security, we take, we take the quick way, okay? Uh, so we get to this, and I think I'm going to skip some of this, but I want to talk about this uh, a little bit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this. The unspiritual self, just as it is by nature, can't receive God's gift of the Spirit, God's Spirit. There's no capacity for them. They seem, they seem like so much silliness, okay? Spirit can only be known by Spirit. God's Spirit and our Spirit in open communion. Spiritually alive, we have access to everything God's Spirit is doing. And can't be judged by unspiritual critics. Isaiah's question says this. Is there anyone who, who, around who knows God's spirit? Anyone who knows what he is doing? And this has been answered. Christ knows. And guess what? We have Christ's spirit inside of us. But for right now, friends, I'm completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other. family time. I'm completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealings with each other and with God. You're acting like infants in relations to Christ. Capable of nothing much more than nursing at the breast. What is that saying? We act like babies. Well then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. This is the Bible. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) Was it the Bible? So I'm going to go ahead and nurse you guys, all right? Is is that weird? Does that sound awkward? As long as you grab what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really much different than a babe at the breast? It's the Bible. Content only when everything's going your way. So often, right now, we do, we grab what's immediately in front of us, and we never grow because of it. All right? As a baby, it's hard to learn to walk. It's not easy. They fall a lot. And that's what we do as Christians. We're ba- basically spiritual babies. 
and we need to be taught to walk. But so many of us never want to be taught to walk. We don't take the opportunity. We keep going back to the breast. That's what the Bible says. Did you hear that on TV out there? We keep going back to the breast. I mean, would it not be weird if you saw a six-year-old, which I've seen before, going back to the breast? Is that not weird? A 13-year-old, mom, I'm hungry. Give me something to drink. Let's think for a second, guys. Shh. This is what we are doing in this very room. When me and my wife sit down and we talk about people that have been here week after week after week and have never changed, when the Spirit of God is here and willing to change you, He wants to take your heart. He wants to begin to speak the truth to you, but instead you continue to listen to the lies. And you are the same as a 13-year-old going back to mom to breastfeed. And you think that's silly and really, quite frankly, disgusting. But that's how we are in Christianity. And there are so many of us in here who are not willing to grow up. And because of that, you you face the same frustrations and temptations over and over again. You continue to listen to the lies. And because of it, you are dying on the inside. But you should not be dying on the inside. Because why? The truth of God says that we're now spiritually alive. If you are spiritually alive then you should not feel dead. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If you feel dead, it's because the only reason is not because you are not alive. It is because you are still listening to the lie of the devil. But because you are alive on the inside. If you've had Jesus come into your heart, which many of, I, of you I know have, but for some reason are still walking around dead. As a shepherd, I can no longer sit back and watch the same things happening every week without telling you the sincerity of my heart that I'm dying on the inside as I'm watching you waste away to nothing. And I'm watching you waste away and die. And I'm telling you this, if this is the passion of my heart, the passion of my heart is only birthed because of the passion that God has put inside of me. And if I only have a, uh, I really can only have a pinch of the passion of God and if you know that this is the passion of my heart you can begin to just have a glimpse of what the passion of God's heart is for you as his children because you are not my children but you are his children understand that this is his passion and desire for you he hates that you're wasting away especially when there's so much life inside of you he hates that you uh, question your acceptance and your security and your significance when you have all of that already stop listening to the lies And if you hear me say that, you say, I don't know how to. I'm telling you, the way you do that is you find out what the truth is. Have you found out the truth? Have you sought out the truth? Have you begun to look for the truth? It is so easy to find it right now that we live in such an age where you can say, in in the Bible, Google it. What is the truth of God about my life? Just Google that. I guarantee you'll have scriptures telling you what God says about you. And I know you'll look at it and be like, oh, that's so hard to believe. All right? But then as you continue to read it, it's like um, when, when, uh, when you get in a fight with your parents and sometimes it takes a long time till you get, you, you get everything fixed, but that has never changed their love for you. Sometimes it takes a while to get back when, when a relationship is broken between maybe you and your mom or your dad, and let me encourage you with your parents, if a relationship has been broken and you've tried to work it back and it's taking some time, it's because sometimes it takes a while to get that fix, okay? And sometimes it takes a while to begin to have this truth ingrained inside of you because the other habits have been ingrained inside of you so long. All right. I'm almost done, I promise. I'm almost done with family time. Are you doing okay? Okay, good. Because you took the brunt of my yelling. I'm going to see if it gets any better. Just joking. All right. 
See, God has given us everything that we need to live a spiritual life, a great life, a full life, a life to the fullest, okay? We don't need, you don't need to go to special services and get zapped and prayed for, all right? I'm telling you, you don't need that, okay? It's nice when that happens. You don't need to pray the right prayer. If I could just pray the right prayer, or if I could just find the right person who knows God enough, or if I could just find this person or read or do this or do that. No, because this is the thing. When you give your life to Christ, you already have this. It's not about a special prayer, being zapped, or all this whatever stuff you'd like to say. If I could just have this person lay hands on me. All those things are nice, and all those things are good, and all those things are awesome. But what you need to know is you already have all of that. In 2 Peter 1.3, it says, Everything that we have to live a life to the fullest, a godly life, has already been given to us when we came into relationship with Jesus Christ. And it says that we receive these things as we get to know him better. See, it's like all this stuff is inside of us, right? And as we get to know Jesus, it starts to get unlocked. See, who you are, what he's called you to do, it just doesn't all come flooding in in one moment and then everything's perfect. What happens is, as you get to know Jesus, you, get, you see him a little bit more, and more of him is revealed to you, and you begin to understand his truth. This is why I wasn't me and who I am right now 10 years ago. I wasn't me like this a year ago. So much has already changed inside of me just over the last year as I begin to pursue him more. All right? We're, we're coming down here to the, to the, long, the, the end stretch here. Okay, I'm, gonna, I skip, I, I'm skipping some stuff, but this is the thing. What we, what we need to do is to learn how to deal with the things that stop us from receiving true significance, acceptance, and security, and the things that stop us from growing, that's, that keep us babies, that keep us going back to the breast. All right? We need to learn... What is stopping us from growing? Why are we not growing? I mean, how come if at moments in time, right, right, where you have seen God's love and you've accepted him as your savior, how come at those moments you've seen him, but for some reason you seem like you've gone backwards instead of forwards? Or you're still the same as you were six weeks ago or six months ago. How come it's no different? You have to figure out what's keeping you from growing because you should be growing. Babies don't stop growing. They, eventually they walk, now they're talking. I'm teaching my kids to read. Isaac is doing some awesome things in math, right Isaac? Isaac's here tonight. Oh, by the way, guys, everyone give a hand up. Melissa Halverson, where'd she go? Melissa Halverson's here tonight. Remember Melissa Halverson? She's awesome. Okay. So there's, th there's, real quick, three things that keep us from growing so much. Number one is ignorance. Many times, this is the thing. It says in the Word of God, some people say, well, if I don't know, then it doesn't matter. But the, the Bible says, my people perish uh, due to their lack of understanding or their lack of wisdom. Ignorance, he says, my people perish because of ignorance, basically. Ignorance is one of the many things that keep, uh, keeps us from growing. Many times we have not been told the truth of who we are in Christ. Maybe you've spent your whole life being told what to do in church instead of being told who you are in church. Many times, maybe even I myself has just told you what to do but haven't told you who you are. This is why you need to find out not, not how to live as a Christian, but find who you are in Christ. And that will teach you everything you need to know. Who are you in Christ? Who are you in Christ? All right. Okay, number two, uh, deception. And this, and, and you can hear deception if you're being deceived. See, the hard thing about being deceived is if you're being deceived, you don't know you're being deceived because you're being deceived, okay? So for you to tell me, well, I'm just not being deceived. Well, I mean, well, let's think about it for a second because if you are being deceived, you're going to say that, Okay. Chances are no one's going to say they're being deceived, whether they're being deceived or not, because you either don't know and you are, or you don't know and you aren't, okay? That's what, how deception works. You don't know you're being deceived, okay? You don't know the power of the dark side, all right? You don't understand the droids are this way, or you don't want to seek those uh, C-3PO and that dude that's gold, all right? However, however they say it, those dudes, those stormtroopers didn't know they were being deceived, but they were being deceived, right? That's how deception works. You might be deceived if you say things like this. This might work for others, but my case is different, and it won't work for me. Have you ever said that? You're being deceived. 
All right, maybe you say this. I can never have faith like so-and-so. I mean, they're different than me. I could never be like that. You're being deceived. It's available to you because the same Jesus that lives inside of them lives inside of you. All right, third thing you might say, God could never use me. God could never use me. You know, the biggest people that God used in the Bible were the biggest sinners. David, one of the most famous men, was checking out naked women on a roof, slept with her, got her pregnant, killed her husband. I'm just saying. Okay, that's the long and short, simple story of David. Okay? He did some other awesome things too. But do you understand? Awesome, awesome thing. Do you understand that God could never use me thing is an excuse because God continually showed over and over again that he would use anybody, okay? And, and every situation is different. Do you know that God in the Bible, in this little book of Hosea, that he once had a guy marry a prostitute, then that prostitute left that dude, and then he said, he told the dude, I want you to go back and I want you to get your wife back. And he's like, I can't get my wife back, she's a prostitute. He's like, I want you to go, and I want you to buy her back. And he had to go buy his own wife back. That's a weird story. Listen, this God can never use me is a deception from the devil. And if you've said these words, God can never use me because of whatever, whatever your excuse doesn't matter, but just have ever said God can never use me, I'm telling you right now, you're being deceived. Okay? Simple. Okay. Third thing, last thing, unresolved personal and spiritual conflicts, and this is my favorite one. We often think that we have the right to be upset and angry with someone, but did you know that actually stops us from growing? Example, if you have never truly forgiven someone who hurt you, you are actually leaving a big door open for the devil to come in and confuse your thinking and stop you from connecting with the truth. Do you know the Bible says that as much as you forgive someone else, you yourself will be forgiven by your father? See, if you, are, if you hold on to unforgiveness, you yourself cannot receive the truth. See, when you are unforgiving, it leaves a door open for the devil to confuse you. You see what I'm saying? And so a lot of times we have this unresolved personal and spiritual conflicts that keep us from going. If you don't close the door by doing what God tells you to do, which is forgiving that person, you are unlikely to grow as a Christian. Once we have decided to believe the truth no matter how we feel, and have dealt with our unresolved spiritual conflict, we are truly free to make a choice every day to obey your flesh or to obey your spirit. Sorry. And again, I'm going to end with this. You can go ahead and have a seat. Let's give Lexi a hand.